morning again to everyone. It's good we can be here this morning and have an opportunity to focus our minds on God's will for this short time to look into the inspired word and try to make some practical application from that as we read and consider these things. We'll be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in just a moment here. Uh, just a, an aside point this morning as I'm opening the mail, we had uh, some flyers that come from different churches and different campaigns that they might be supporting. And an interesting one came in this morning. Uh, church is supporting a plan to read the New Testament. It's kind of like a challenge to read the New Testament in 30 days. Uh, that flyer is back there, and there's a, a, a bookmark that kind of details that out. But the, basically the math behind that plan or that bookmark, if you read six chapters a day, you could read the New Testament in 30 days. So if that's too aggressive, you break it down to three chapters a day, you could read the entire New Testament in two months. So just kind of breaking it down into bites. So maybe if you haven't done that in a, in a way that's, you know, consecutive like that, it might be something you'd be interested in. Uh, people can tell you what the Bible says. You can listen to people's opinions on it. But there's just something entirely different when you read it for yourself and have that direct connection to what God's will is uh, just between you and him as you read. We'll begin with chapter 15, 1 Corinthians Verse 1. So, of course, this is a letter to the church at Corinth. And quick glance here. This is written by Paul. So, a, a letter written by Paul the Apostle to the church at Corinth. Uh, chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen all by me also, as by one born out of due time. So as we start in chapter 15, Paul's just giving that account of the risen Christ and the faith that we can have in him. And he's recounting essentially a history of all those who saw Jesus risen. Uh, 500 some people, and then he calls out some specific names, and then he mentions himself as we can read of that account on the road to Damascus. Uh, we know Paul, as he was Saul before, was uh, part of that establishment of the old law that was denying Christ. And, of course, Paul was vehemently denying Christ and persecuting the church and was confronted by God himself and was blinded. And we know that how the story continues from there. I'm going to continue on with verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet nor I, but by the grace of God which was with me, therefore whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed." The next heading in my New King James, the risen Christ, our hope. Continuing in verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. 
And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So Paul is confronting some of those who maybe acknowledged Christ at the time, but for whatever reason were denying the resurrection of Christ. And there are many still that will do that. They'll offer some honor to Christ as a prophet or as a good man or, you know, things of that nature, but not acknowledge that he was the son of God and that he was resurrected. So we can still encounter people that will hold to that uh, belief or, or lack thereof. I'm going to continue on with verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead. And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since, by, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So we think about the idea of Jesus defeating death. We see that illustrated in many other scripture. Jesus defeated death through that execution of that plan that God had given him uh, to live and, and to die and to rise as a savior. The mention of Jesus being the first fruits from the dead. He was the, the first to be resurrected, to rise and to live eternally in that effect. And we have the illusion of how we essentially get to mimic that through him. I want to look at verse 29, continuing on. The effects of dying, the resurrection. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So, one notable verse there in our, our popular culture, I suppose, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. That's quoted in Shakespeare, and we'll hear that commonly. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And it's, uh, it's noted in, in other scripture similarly. And it's just uh, a bit of a sarcastic note, as I would take it from Paul. If, if we don't rise, if there's no resurrection, then we might as well just enjoy life. We might as well just party on and you know, get everything we can out of this life because this is it. There's no life beyond this. And I think Paul is just kind of calling to that ridiculousness in that mentality as we know that Jesus rose and is alive as we can be as well. I'm going to carry on in verse 35. 
But someone will say, how are you, the dead, raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and ter terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spirit is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. The man, the first man was of the earth, made of the dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the dust, of the man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. It's an interesting way that Paul is trying to relate to those who would be hearing this letter, uh, talking about the corruptible becoming the incorruptible, talking about how something that, for example, seed, something has to die to create the seed to be planted for something new to come. Uh, talking about the physical has to happen first before the spiritual. So naturally, us being in the flesh, we're in that, that physical realm, that seed realm right now. And this physical flesh, that seed that was created, there has to be that death before that spiritual renewal can happen. Uh, a lot of figurative and uh, insightful illustrations for people to try and grasp and understand uh, the parallels and also the description of Adam coming from the dust from the dirt and Jesus coming from heaven and uh, that life giving spirit it's, uh, it's a nice way I think for us to try to relate and try to understand. It's, it's really a lot to grasp when you're considering what the purpose of this life is and what is it all about. And, and some people I've heard recently are describing this life as a soul test, which is kind of an interesting way to, to put it also. But, you know, we think about what is the meaning of life, that, that common question, and I think it can be simply summed up, just do God's will. That's, that's what the purpose of this life is. That's the soul test. If we're doing God's will and constantly trying to strive and find what his nature is, what his insight and will is for us in this lifetime, I think that it gives us that uh, kind of drawing down of what we're seeing here in, in these words, uh, the seed. Uh, the new life that comes from it, uh, the death of the corruptible, and the rising of the incorruptible. And we have that opportunity to rise incorruptible in Christ. It's only through him. Uh, Jesus said that no one comes to the Father except through him, uh, very simply. And <clears throat> as we think about all these things and we think about the instruction to salvation. We're, we're in a process now where we're hearing the word and hopefully we're helping others around us to hear the word. And uh, Many of us have believed that word and hopefully more will come to that opportunity to believe and we can help others to, to do the same. And as we believe and learn, we realize that need for repentance. We realize that we're sinners and that without Jesus, we can't find salvation. We can't come to the Father without him. 
He is that living sacrifice that forgives us of our sins. And we take that opportunity, and, and we're doing it now in a, a different way. We're confessing Jesus this morning. We've done that. We've confessed him until he returns as we took the, the emblems this morning with the Lord's Supper. And then that next step uh, for those who are new and as we talk to those around us who are unfamiliar, uh, we need to teach baptism and the importance of that, how it's that simple opportunity to sign that contract. We don't just get to, in life, call ourselves uh, college students or homeowners or so many other things that are pretty simple for us to understand. You have to sign on the dotted line. You have to make that commitment. And the way we sign on the dotted line for Jesus is to simply be baptized. That's the act that we take. And then beyond that, we have the opportunity to live a godly life. And it's a, a continual struggle. Uh, Christians continue to sin. We fall short. All have fallen short. But we continue to strive on and uh, try and be that seed that will someday be planted and rise anew and corruptible. That's all I have this morning. Uh, if there's anyone subject to an invitation or if anyone has any need where we can bear one another's burden, that opportunity exists as well. You can make it known as we stand and sing the invitation song.